Hey, I'm Liam Slayer, and this is This Week I Watched, where I talk about the wrestling that I watched this week. This week started on the 16th, and there was an anniversary that I saw on Twitter. Not of a massive match, but it was uh, Zack Sabre Jr. versus AJ Styles from Rev Pro High Stakes 2016, which was on the 16th of June, not June, January. Good start, Liam. Um... AJ Styles is set to debut at the Rumble on the 24th. He's pretty much all but confirmed. Um, there's new stories out about it. And funnily, it, weeks before he's set to debut at the Royal Rumble, um, he does the last of his uh, appearances where he's got belts. But he also did the short run five star tour, which went from Newcastle to Sheffield to Liverpool. Uh, in arenas, in all the, the main arenas, uh, and drew horrendously. I was there as part of the production team, and we went from Newcastle to Sheffield, stayed in Sheffield, and then travelled across to Liverpool. Um, now, we were in, the production team, were in an Ibis budget hotel, and so were all the wrestlers. Which And this the list of people that were on this five-star tour was ridiculous. Uh, AJ Styles was on it, Rey Mysterio was on it, um, there was Khalito there as well, uh, a, a myriad of names that I'm completely forgetting. But imagine, imagine you are set to debut for the, the biggest wrestling company in the world, especially at that point in time, uh, or the biggest Western wrestling company in the world, on one of their biggest shows of, of all time, like the Rumbles, like to debut at the Rumbles, incredible. Imagine you knew that was coming up, and three weeks earlier, you were in an Ibis budget hotel in Sheffield. Yeah, you can't write that stuff really, but that's a mad world of professional wrestling. Anyway, uh, I watched this Rev Pro match. It was really fun. It was a really good one. It's a it's a mad high point for British wrestling. I think like you look at it and like the 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 caliber of people that are on the car, the caliber of people that are in that main event, the the buildings round that are at York Hall, uh, the crowd's just hot all the way through it. Um, it's it's real madness, but it's it's a very big reminder of British wrestling where. The canvas has gaffer tape covering up rips on it. So there's like, we're at a massive high point. 2016 is an incredible time for British wrestling. And yet the canvas still has rips that it's covered up in gaffer tape on. And this is a huge match. AJ Styles is about to go to uh, WWE. Zack Sabre Jr. is about to light up the world. He's just done um, Battle of Los Angeles and stuff like that. And we can't get a new canvas. But anyway, the wrestling itself is real fun. Like it, it builds into like a... a a very New Japan-esque match, which is obviously pretty typical for the two guys. Um, the wrestling starts off quite nice, and it sort of builds up in its pace. Like It's not so much the um, good guy on top, bad guy on top going into finish. It's very much like a an escalation of wrestling that goes up and up and up. Um, I always felt like there's a great back end near for where... Sabre hits like a rope kick, a Pele kick, uh, and then triangles. Um, sorry, he goes for a triangle that AJ Styles turns into the Styles Clash crowd, even though they know Styles is going, absolutely bought it. And I find that like Zack Sabre's like, wrap-up finishes that he does, where like he grabs a limb and then another one and then another one, are always really well-timed. I think that's a really, it's a really tricky thing to pull off, to be able to like grab several limbs and have the audience bite at each point, and I think Zack Sabre Jr. is very, very, very good at doing that. Um, you can feel like the anticipation building as you get past what I would refer to as like the end submissions. Zack Sabre's got like an armbar point in there, I believe, uh, and Styles has got the calf crusher in their calf killer. Once you get past that point, the audience suddenly come alive and they're like, all right, cool, we're, we're close now. Uh, it's not exactly a finished product on Zack Sabre Jr. at that point in time. He's very, very close, but I don't think he really starts hitting his stride until probably like 2017, 18. And there's glimpses where it's like, mm, I don't think Zack Sabre Jr. would do that now, uh, and because that's because he's refined his product. But he's still one hell of a wrestler at that point. The the match is a really fun, fun one. It's just interesting to compare. AJ Styles is... AJ Styles is at his peak at that point, so his WWE run, I think, only just compares back to that. 
but Sabre, you can see the growth that he's gone through, not just as like a physical body, but then also as a wrestler and his psychology and things that he does do and things that he doesn't do and how he carries himself in the ring. But it's a really, it's a really fun, a really fun match to go and watch back at. It's something that I would look to do. Okay, so the next thing that I watched, I'm going to go on a slight sub-tangent here. Last week, I was talking about Nigel McGuinness and Jerry Lynn, and I tried to find out where that show happened, and I ended up on a Ring of Honor website that had a video on it of the match. But it wasn't that match, it was a later match, and there were also other matches that were on this page. So, through a bit of trial and error, I worked out that basically, you can watch pretty much, I want to say... 80% 80% of Ring of Honor's backlog um, through going through this link. So I'm going to link the the website, or I'm going to link the, the link to this match that I'm going to talk about um, with a way of going to watch it. So if you're interested in watching old Ring of Honor stuff, you can go to this link and basically type in a year and find whatever wrestling you want to find. So in that, um, I went back to 2004 uh, and watched Chris Saban versus Jimmy Jacobs in a pure title tournament qualifier. Uh, this was from the 10th of January, so I was very much very much stuck in a January phase at the beginning of this week. Um, it's an absolutely fine match. A um, couple of rickets here and there. It's not a banger, but they give a lot, and I think that is very much what ROH was built on. Like Sometimes I think about it where I talk about Danielson and uh, McGuinness and Samoa Joe and I go, but these guys are like the top of the top. But even with that, you look at a, a lower card position, someone like a Chris Saban, and you go, okay, I can see where the foundation of ROH like lies through this. Um, Jimmy Jacobs is very much in his formative years here. He's doing this like weird huss gimmick, like it's a tribute to Brody, and he drops like a big like bruiser Brody knee at one point. It's, it's weird. Uh, and he also looks like a boy next to Chris Saban. Like, it's a benefit to Chris Saban because he looks massive compared to Jimmy Jacobs. Um, I'm guessing Jimmy at this point must be maybe 18. Um, but yeah, Saban looks like an absolute star through it. I, I'm glad Saban got like the props that he deserved in Impact when like he won the belt and stuff like that. But I always feel like Chris Saban's someone that probably isn't as highly regarded as he could be. And I'm glad that him and Shelley um, got the props that they deserved going to AEW and doing that. But even then, that should have been a tag match. They shouldn't have been in a six-man. Anyway, sub-tangent. Um, what's a bit odd about this is that it's a pure division, like um, it's a pure title tournament type of thing. But there's there's nothing that touches on it. It's just a regular match. And it, But again, this is very formative ROH, 2004. Two guys that are still like very new to it. They've not really found their identity yet. But you can you can feel where they're going with it. And even though I'm singing the praises of Chris Saban, something to think about here is that he's great, but I couldn't tell you anything about who he is other than I really like watching him, which is not a detriment to him because a lot of good people have got over like that. But I couldn't say anything about what Chris Saban stands for or who he is as a wrestler from watching this match. If you're on Twitter, you may be familiar with WCW Deep Cuts. It's an account that posts like little clips of WCW, like B, C, D tier shows. Um, Something that he does now and again is he puts access up to the Google Drive for like $5. So a couple of months ago, I went, you know what? Bullshit. I'll probably find some decent stuff out of this. So I, I paid it, still got access to it, and every now and again I, I dip into it. Um, so a random one that I almost didn't watch and then went to go back and watch it because of something that comes up later. But it was WCW Saturday night from the 26th of February in 2000. Um, the first match on the... Well, the first match that I watched from the show was Shark Boy versus Jeremy Lopez. Now, I'm familiar with Shark Boy. You're probably familiar familiar with Shark Boy as well. TNA run, all that good stuff. Um, I'm not familiar with Jeremy Lopez, though. He moves really nice, but his body's really lacking. And I couldn't tell you anything about who he is. At least with Shark Boy, he's got a mask on. And he does shark things now and again, like bites to the butt. So I, I can see, okay, cool, there's at least a character there. Jeremy Lopez... Couldn't tell you that. But in saying that, the content is really nice. Like, it's 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 a really, really fun watch. Uh, Lopez does some really nice takeovers at the beginning. Shark Boy, like, does the fucking flip stunner gimmick, and that's really nice. Um, that's the finish out of it. It's just a really fun match, and it feels 
very prototype X division. You can feel like the formation of it coming into place here. And I feel like maybe a couple of years later, Jeremy Lopez, and he might have actually appeared in early X division TNA. I don't actually know. Um, but in saying that, this this is the sort of wrestling that I love. I absolutely love it because there's almost no consequences to it. There's no big story to it, but the the telling great wrestling in a ring. Like I grew up watching Velocity and Heat and those sort of shows. Like Sa Rios is like one of my boys. It's it's one of those things where I love watching this like C D tier wrestling, and this is a, a prime example of great wrestling that just happens for the sake of happening next match that follows up with that is billy kidman against uh alexis skipper or El- elix skipper one of the two uh anyway you're probably familiar with both of them uh billy kidman obviously had a great run in wcw and then went to wwe and had a banger theme that just didn't fit him uh and skipper is known for if you've ever seen tna uh, tna and you've seen any like oh my god moments from it you've probably seen like the um cage walk rana spot that's Elixis, Elix Skipper. Elix, Ele- do you know what? I'm not even going to bother looking at it. I've committed to this now. Um, again, this is a really fun match. Kidman takes this really mad bump from the apron to the floor. Um, and then like Skipper like follows up with this crazy dive. Uh, it's lovely stuff. Bizarrely hits an, like a double axe handle in the match. I, it, it's very rare that you see a double axe handle hit unless you're watching Pop Punk Kid. Um, but yeah, it just hits one of those. And it's a really quick back and forth. There's no real down. Again, like this is very, it's very much a prototype for the X Division. But you can also feel that Billy Kidman, through the time that he spent in WCW, and at this point he'll have had, or is in the midst of the run with the New Blood stuff that might have happened slightly earlier. You can feel that he's like, I don't want to say clinging to the 90s. But he's very much a '90s wrestler, where Skipper is very much going forward into the uh, into the noughties, and you can feel that that division between the two watching them wrestle. And then the final match that I watched um, on this card is Jim Duggan versus Lord Stephen Regal. So yeah, William Regal appears in WCW in 2000. This was something that I didn't realize had happened, and it was only when I looked at the card that I went, "What? What's Regal doing there?" That I had to go and, and watch it. So basically, um, he had a a short couple of months stint back in WCW. Came back with a, so this is after he's done the real man man stuff. So he's been in WWF. He then went back to rehab. He then came out of rehab. Went to WCW for a couple of months. I later found out from talking to somebody that. He did that to get the visa for his family. Once that had all been sorted, he then left and went to WWF. So this match against Jim Duggan is the final match for William Regal in WCW. It's a career versus title match. Um, Jim Duggan found the television title in the bin or something like that. I don't know. Um, But yeah, it's a title versus career match. It's very by the numbers. Um, Regal's extremely smooth on a bump and feed. Like he just to touch on like the wrestler's adage of like oh footwork and positioning regal's fantastic at limited steps that make everything look smoother and crisper um that don't detract from the realism of it um but and then jim duggan is just an 80s wrestler really 80s wrestling just isn't something that particularly like no sorry i take that back 80s wwf wrestler is just something that I just don't massively vibe with. Um, the kicks, punches, a finishing move. Now, 70s, 80s, NWA style of wrestling and that that wrestling back and forth stuff, I'm well on board with. But the more that I've found wrestling, the, the less that I care about Hogan-esque style wrestling. Um, but yeah, it's very by the numbers. The only highlight out of it is that it's bizarrely William Regal's last match in WCW, which I thought was way before this, but actually turns out it's in 2000, which is pretty mad. I hopped back to the present day onto IWTV and once again, for probably the fifth time, which only adds to about 20 minutes, I watched the uh, four-way of myself, Jet Marshall, Joe Wade and Ellis Barker from the Rise Rumble from Rise Underground Wrestling. Um, I'm pretty happy with watching it back. Um, we could have done more. I don't think that it would have mattered to the crowd. I don't think the crowd needed more. Um, and there were a couple of moments where 
maybe there was a little bit of timing that could have been sat into different places or like we could have taken like a bit more time in moments just to let the crowd dip and go. Uh, but in saying that, we were asked for action. We supplied action. Um, we did about four minutes. But hey, it's a uh, crop top sprint season, so what do you expect? But then with that, I was thinking about the match and I was like, I wonder if there is anything else that we could have done given the time that we could have potentially had. Um, so, and this actually works out quite nicely because Attack Pro Wrestling has just returned. Um, Mark Andrews had a, sh- a surprise birthday show yesterday, which was the 21st, 21st of January. Um, but I watched um, the Attack 4-Way, which is Ryu versus Ken versus Eddie Gordo versus Sub-Zero. So that's Pete Dunne versus Damian Dunne versus Ryan Smile versus Chris Brooks. As a bit of a comparison piece. Now, bell to bell, I worked out that they pretty much went the time that we were allotted in terms of our bell to bell. Um, I think there's like, there's things that are similar and there's things that are different. So some things to consider. The venue and familiar, familiar, how familiar the audience are with the wrestlers is something to think about. In the attack venue, they've been there a good number of years. This is um, press start to... So, like, they've been there a good while. The audience are, like, well involved and they know exactly who these people are and stuff like that. So they've got that connection with them. I would say that the Brood and L crowd didn't know as much of who we were in the Rise match. Uh, and then also experience level. I would I would hazard a bet that the people that were in... Well, I say experience level. One, in terms of how long we've all been around and wrestling. But then also just the years and just how... British wrestling has changed and the mindset that we have now when it comes to like scramble type matches uh, and how we piece those together obviously it evolves and it becomes slightly different but it's saying oh and also they've got a con- they're a concept piece and it's a concept piece in places in that like there are video game references and Damien Dunn is doing like the whole fighter stance all the way through it which is a, a great commitment to the bit um, they have like a freeze spot which again Chris Brooks has been sub-zero. So it all sort of plays into that, which again, pulls the audience on board, which we didn't have as much of. But in saying that, a lot of the spots aren't too dissimilar. We went like dive, dive, dive straight away, but there's like more spaced out. Um, And I feel like the audience were probably at a similar level all the way through. And like towards the back end, we got, I would say that we got the same reaction as they got pretty much. Um, we both had the same job of being a, a fast paced action, 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 multi-man early in a card. We were third. They were first. Um, and I'd say spot wise, we pretty much did similar. Um, there's actually a couple of spots that are, are actually quite mirrored. Um, but overall, I think we did what we needed to do out of it. So I was glad. And like, I watched that match as a comparison piece and I didn't come away from it going, damn, we should have done this, this, and this. I actually came away from it and went, yeah, we held pretty well in that. The wrestling world was obviously taken this past week with the passing of Jay Briscoe. Uh, really, a really awful incident, and there's been more than enough that's been covered about it. Um, but in saying that, obviously, he's been on the minds of a lot of people, and there's been a lot of stuff shared around him. Um, so I watched uh, the Briscoes against the Motor City Machine Guns from... Oh, I want to say it was like 2007, 2008 ROH. Uh, Motor Machine Guns had just come back from their extended stint at TNA. It might actually be later than 2008. Yeah, it's probably a bit later than 2008. But Motor Machine Guns had just come back from like an extended stint in TNA where they can now come back to Ring of Honor um, and they were challenging for the belts. It's a great contest. It's just really fun. And again, it, there's been a lot said about Jay Briscoe and stuff like that. I have no personal stories about him. I wouldn't go into too much detail about it. Um, I've always enjoyed his wrestling. I always thought he was a, a hell of a wrestler. You can tell like the commitment that he has, but also the fun that he has in the ring. Um, and he's obviously, I want to say experimental in that like he's just willing to give stuff a go and do stuff um, while staying very true to who he is and to the sport of professional wrestling. It's a great contest. Um, it's about 40 minutes, but it so doesn't feel like that. It absolutely flies through. The back end is just incredible stuff. So if you get a chance, Briscoes versus Motor City Machine Guns is a very, very good watch uh, and highlights uh, the plus sides of Jay Briscoe. Final bit rounding out this week, I sat down to watch the 
18th of January edition of AEW Dynamite, mainly for Brian Danielson against Bandito. Um, I enjoyed it. I think it's fun. Uh, it's a great pace. Uh, Danielson highlights Bandito without giving away too much. Like, he does a great job on being like, hey, here's this guy that you should care about and that is really interesting. Why don't you watch him? Um, but without being like, without stacks and stacks and stacks of moves that I find sometimes when people when people are trying to get over or when they want to get over or when they're thinking about, right, this is my debut somewhere, what am I going to do? They go, I'm going to hit this and this and this and this and this and this and this. And the person kicks out of all the moves and actually the audience, the audience go, sort of kicked out of all your moves there, um, which sometimes works if they're executed to like an extremely high level, but often doesn't. I think this is a great way of highlighting somebody where Danielson gives a lot but then doesn't take away and it isn't to the detriment of the match uh, or the detriment of Bandido. Uh, I might have said Bandito earlier on. That was a mistake. Bandido. Um, personally, I'd have liked more like grappling stuff at the beginning, but I'm a proper loser for that. Um, Danielson's just just really good, isn't he? But yeah, overall, I'd have liked to have seen like, more grappling, more wrestling stuff, but I don't think that the audience that AEW are looking at wanted that um, or would really grow to that or needed more of it so they obviously did the right thing now if they were in I don't know PWG um, then that match would probably look different it'd probably have an extended amount of time Bandido would be obviously way more established with a PWG crowd so they could actually go back and forth a little bit more um, but yeah overall I enjoyed it it didn't didn't take my breath away, but it was fun. Uh, and Danielson's just just good, isn't he? He's just he's just the best. I can't I can't argue with it. Um, and then from there, I actually went back to the so Danielson and Bandido is around the hour mark. It's right bang in the middle of Dynamite. Um, I went back to the beginning because I wanted to watch um, Jay Lethal versus Orange Cassidy, and actually, I probably enjoyed that match more than I did Danielson and Bandido. Now, I know Jay Lethal gets a bit of a bad rep and stuff like that, and people call him boring and whatnot. I actually don't mind Jay Lethal. I think he's quite fun. I love best friends. Like, it, basically, across the board in this match, it's just a bunch of character shit from everybody that's around. So you've got Lethal, you've got Cassidy, um, you've got best friends on the outside, you've got um, Sanjay, Satnam Singh, and uh, Jeff Jarrett, Dan Housen comes into it. Do you know what? It's just good classic pro wrestling, where there's a match happening, but there's all these things going on around it. And it just feels like everybody's having fun. Uh, but then also, there's some really good clean wrestling that happens in ring. It's just a bizarre mix of people. But yet, yeah, I can feel like everybody's being like, yeah, then what about this? Yeah, and what if like Dan Housen like, steals the guitar? And it's just fun. Now, I think I'm probably in a minority of people that like that stuff. And I think there's a lot of people that are like, Oh, this is too much. And oh, this is stupid. I love it. I think for a mid card position in wrestling where they're not taking themselves too seriously, hey, it's all good. If there's a belt there, there's a belt there, whatever. I know a big complaint about AEW at the moment is that they've got a million belts. It doesn't really feel like it's based around the belt, it feels like it's based around the wrestlers, and I think that's fine. I also like that Orange Cassidy comes out with a belt in the bag. Um but yeah, it, I like it. I'm all about this feud. I would like to see where it goes. Um, if I hear more, I'm not super bothered about Jeff Jarrett. Like he's grown on me over the years, but his his theme is one of the best. I'd argue it's yeah, yeah I'd argue it's like probably top ten in terms of wrestling themes across the uh, across the world. And that brings me to the end of this week I watched. Um, pretty front end um, of a week. I didn't really catch much over this weekend. Um, overall, I'm pretty happy with what I watched. I think I've watched some like pretty cool bits. Like I'm glad that I went into the deep dive of WCW and found like the Saturday Night Show. Probably do that again. Next, oh, this continues the run of me watching a Alex Shelley match and a Danielson match every week. Um, this is the first week that I've not watched a Speedball Mike Bailey match. Interestingly, um, so let's see how how this continues on. I was thinking the other day. Now that I'm recording these, I can probably log everybody that I've watched out of it 
Um, so yeah, we'll see from there. Um, I've got no wrestling this weekend, or I've had no wrestling this weekend. Uh, this weekend, or the next weekend coming, this weekend coming, whatever way we want to say it. I've got True Grit. Uh, I've got True Grit on the 27th, he says. Not too sure, looking at his calendar right now. It is, no, it's the 28th. Uh, I'm wrestling Dan Evans on the 28th at PPW. Uh, so that'd be a nice easy one. I've also got MEW on the 27th. That'll be me up in Newcastle. Um, so a fairly, fairly busy weekend. And then we've got PPW in-house shows. Uh, if you want to check out our in-house shows, they are on YouTube on the Pursuit Pro Wrestling YouTube channel. Uh, once again, if you've enjoyed this, thank you very much. Um, leave a comment if you have watched any of the matches and if you would like to compare notes, I'd be more than happy to. If you've got a match that you'd like me to watch, whatever you want me to watch, I will may actually know. I take that back. Not whatever you want me to watch. I'll be selective. Uh, next week, I'm probably going to watch some World of Sports stuff. And because it got mentioned in the Danielson Bandido match, I'm probably going to try and find some Blue Panther wrestling. Spoiler alert, I hate Lucha wrestling. I find it super dull. But we'll get there. I may. No. No, I won't. I was going to say, I may watch um, rewatch a terrible cage match um, from a Lucha company. But that was an hour. And I just can't do that to myself. So, yeah. Anyway, I will catch you next week. Thank you for listening.